flow states are states of heightened focus that bring about enhanced reflexes, a sense of time dilation, creative problem solving, and a feeling of infallible calm. Nootropics are supplements, medications, and other compounds used with the somewhat transhuman goal of enhancing human cognition to increase productivity and performance. Seems like a match made in heaven, right? As long-term discerning viewers of this channel will know, I'm fascinated with both, but also believe that both have their issues. That said, in this video, I'll attempt to outline some strategies for triggering and enhancing flow through the use of nootropics. I've already done in-depth research into the nature of flow, which you can check out in my previous two Mastering Ultra Instinct videos in this series. Likewise, there's a written post that accompanies this video that I'll link to in the description down below. There, I explain what a flow state is and what it isn't, and I take a look at some other popular strategies for getting there, like microdosing or using the hippie speedball. I also discuss why I think they're misguided at best and dumb at worst. But the Cliff Notes version. It irritates me when people describe flow states as the ultimate state of human performance. There's no one ultimate state. The human brain works best when it can change between states quickly. You wouldn't want to be in a flow state when you were trying to get to sleep. A healthy brain is one that's able to adapt to the demands placed on it. People like Stephen Kotler want to commodify flow states to turn them into a panacea that can cure every ailment, such that they can sell books and programs. But in truth, a flow state is merely a state of intent concentration on a particular task. The point where any task can become meditative. Where you're so engrossed in it that time appears to slow down and we seem to be able to pull off feats that would otherwise normally be lost to us. Ideas come easily and reaction times increase. This is where the confusion regarding transient hypofrontality comes from, I think. This is the term that describes the apparent shutdown of the prefrontal cortex, the default mode network, and the sense of the self or ego. Brain imaging shows that our forwards planning and reflective areas close off, and we therefore lose that inner critic that often distracts us from the task at hand. Many find this loss of self very liberating, and in fact seek flow states as a kind of intoxication. Freud would describe this as the Thanatos instinct, that is to say that it seems some people are just trying to escape themselves, turning flow states into an alternative for things like alcohol. That's not what I'm interested in at all. I speculate that in fact we can achieve flow states without shutting down the prefrontal cortex entirely. It simply depends on what you are focused on. If you focus on surfing, then of course that'll mean that you'll lose that inner voice. You'll be focused on balance and on the amazing view around you, not on what you had for lunch. But if you're 100% focused on writing, then I suspect that you'd see less shutdown of these areas. I've put it to you that it's not hyperfrontality that causes flow, but rather it's a symptom of some forms of flow. And indeed, brain scans of rappers inflow show that specific areas of the prefrontal cortex, called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, shuts down, while the medial prefrontal cortex remains active. Think of flow more like brain efficiency then. If all it took for us to be in a state of flow was hyperfrontality, then we'd be in flow whenever we were highly stressed. As we know, this is very far from being the case. And this is why we can't simply rely on stimulants to get into flow either. In my previous research, my conclusion was that it was being in a state of calm arousal that was more similar to flow. That means experiencing a sympathetic response, but maintaining your higher brain function as needed. It's the difference between being psyched up and being psyched out. To that end, neuropeptide Y and DHEA might have a role to play here. So we know that excitatory neurotransmitters like dopamine, norepinephrine, play a role in stimulating flow. And we know that serotonin, which makes you feel good and aids with creativity, might also be involved. Things that I think might also play a role though are neuropeptide Y and DHEA. DHEA buffers the effects of cortisol on the hippocampus, preventing that prefrontal lobotomy feeling by allowing us to still access our memories and ideas even when we're highly stressed. Neuropeptide Y or NPY on the other hand is able to reduce the effects of norepinephrine on the prefrontal regions of the brain, again helping us to actually access the higher functions of our brain whilst we're in a state of heightened arousal. This also linked to learning appetite and more. Studies show that the top performing elite athletes and special operations personnel produce more DHEA and NPY chemicals in the face of extreme stress, and this is what sets them apart from their peers. It allows them to perform better than most in demanding situations and to thrive under pressure when others go to pieces, to stay focused despite intense distractions. So that's what you need to know about flow. Without further ado then, here are some stacks that may be able to encourage states of flow. Keep in mind that I'm recommending nothing simply discussing the topic out of interest and because it's cool. Caffeine and L-theanine. So this is one of the oldest nootropic stacks going and one of the most popular. And it's for good reason too. Once you dive into it, you'll realize that this is an almost perfect synergistic combination for increasing flow. You'll know caffeine. Found in tea and coffee, it works by blocking adenosine receptors, 
thereby reducing the groggy effects of being awake too long. The wakefulness is then compounded by a release of dopamine, norepinephrine, etc. All this boosts concentration and focus, but it also risks making us jittery and anxious and potentially reducing creativity. But that's where the L-theanine comes in, an amino acid that occurs naturally in green tea alongside caffeine and that's able to create a relaxed state of focus. L-theanine works by blocking the effects of the highly abundant and excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. This essentially prevents the brain from going into an anxious overdrive when it gets highly aroused. Like caffeine, it's also neuroprotective in the long term, but what's perhaps the most interesting thing about all this is that it also appears to help create alpha and possibly theta brainwaves, the brainwaves associated with flow states and meditation. This is normally consumed at a ratio of 1 to 2, that's 100 milligrams of caffeine to 200 milligrams of theanine, and from my experience it certainly does help to elicit a state of calm focus, not that you can expect to notice a radical difference. ADAPT 232 While researching this topic, I came across a number of different adaptogens capable, at least in theory, of supporting flow. I started to craft a stack that I was pretty excited by and was about to unveil it, and then I realised that it was actually already a thing, or at least an extremely similar stack already existed. Specifically, I was accidentally recreating a natural performance boosting stack that was tested on elite athletes, astronauts and special operatives in Russia before the days of steroids, called ADAPT-232. ADAPT-232 consists of Siberian ginseng, aka Eleuthero, Rhodiola rosea and Schisandra chinensis. An adaptogen is a naturally occurring herbal supplement with a rather vague definition, that being that it acts on multiple pathways. So Rhodiola rosea is a traditional Chinese remedy that acts on the adrenals and has anti-fatiguing properties. Studies show that it's able to increase tolerance to high pressure and high stress activities, preventing burnout. In one study of 161 military cadets, it was found that it could significantly boost mental work capacity over placebos. It's neuroprotective in the long term and it works by elevating dopamine and norepinephrine as well as serotonin, three of the neurotransmitters identified as playing an important role in flow. In at least one study, it's also been shown to significantly increase BDNF in the hippocampus. Siberian ginseng, also known as Eleuthero, is not really a ginseng at all, but is actually a totally different species of herb. What it is, is another anti-fatiguing agent that's been shown to improve tolerance and adaptation to novel stressors in military personnel. But again, what I find most interesting of all is the role it might have in regulating the response to stress via neuropeptide Y systems. Siberian ginseng actually appears to increase many of the chemicals associated with stress, but helps the body to better cope with them at the same time. Schisandra is the odd one out here. This is a berry-bearing plant and a cofactor that may help you to get more from other nootropics. It raises nitric oxide, thereby aiding blood circulation. And in one study, it was found to reduce the production of cortisol in athletes. It appears to help reverse stress-induced damage via changes to the monoamine transmitters and plasma corticosterone. It's also been suggested that it may enhance eyesight and night vision. So I tried this complete stack and found that it did manage to increase my focus and attention to a certain degree. Moreover, it seemed to help me cope with extremely high workloads and the sleep deprivation that comes from being a parent. Unfortunately, I also found that Rhodiola rosea in particular gave me a churny stomach. But it was this experiment that also clued me in onto what the answer might be for actually increasing flow via a nootropic stack. Vitamin D, omega-3, magnesium 3 and 8 and ashwagandha with optional inositol, creatine, lutein and curcumin. So in my opinion, using nootropics to trigger flow is misguided. Anything that can cause a flood of one neurotransmitter will artificially force you into one mental state, robbing you of the ability to change gears as needed. Instead, we need to think about supporting the brain's natural ability to get into flow by providing the health and energy it needs. The brain is designed to produce excitatory neurotransmitters when something important is happening, to thereby enhance energy, enthusiasm, focus, creativity and reaction times. The problem is A, when this is accompanied by anxiety that makes it hard for us to think, and B, that very often we simply feel too tired and too disinterested to summon this enthusiasm. So what's going on? Why can't you engage with that important task and activate a flow state? Focusing purely on the physiological side of things for a moment, the answer may be to do with adrenal fatigue. It's no secret that most of us spend an inordinate amount of time in a state of high arousal. We're stressed all the time by our alarm clocks, by our commute, by looking at a computer screen, by work, but at the same time, we don't find any of this particularly interesting. So too many of us suffer from adrenal fatigue and craving something interesting and entertaining. So it's no wonder that we struggle to summon our superhuman focus at the office the next day or that evening when training or starting a new business. So the best nootropic stack should instead focus on recovering the brain. We should view this process as biphasic, 
enhancing the recovery so that we can go into the next day with the optimal chance of attacking work with plenty of energy and enthusiasm. Omega-3 fatty acid is neuroprotective, it'll reduce inflammation, it speeds up neuronal transmission through improved cell membrane permeability, and it even supports neuroplasticity, essentially strengthening the connections between brain cells. What's more though is it also helps to increase the production of DHEA, the hormone that helps to buffer the effects of stress that we saw earlier. Vitamin D likewise helps to support healthy levels of DHEA, as well as testosterone and other key hormones. Magnesium supplementation is useful to support vitamin D supplementation, but can also encourage better sleep when taken in the evening, and most importantly can support neuroplasticity. Adaptogens, as we've seen, are generally very effective at helping the body to cope with stress. This is likely why I had success with Adapt 232, as well as with Cordyceps a long time ago. Basically, they were just helping me to get back to my baseline. Many of us are living with some degree of burnout, and taking the time to correct that can yield amazing benefits. So for long-term support, ashwagandha is a good choice because it's been shown to raise DHEA levels and lower cortisol by up to 26%. It also helps to regenerate axons and dendrites, reconstruct synapses, and support BDNF production. And there's plenty more I'd add to a stack like this, including lutein, creatine, curcumin, etc. But it starts to get a little bit expensive. I include inositol on this list too, as it's able to help boost the density of neurotransmitter receptors. The good news is that all these ingredients, except maybe the ashwagandha, are easy to get through your normal balanced diet, which is a very strong option. They're perfectly natural, no side effects. Instead of hacking the brain, we're simply ensuring that it has the nutrients it's designed to thrive on, in order to better cope with the demands we're trying to place on it. Like I say, it's a biphasic approach, a yin and a yang, and it also means that getting proper rest is vitally important. Just like you wouldn't expect to go extremely hard in the gym every day without so much as resting come evening. And that's why you can't just keep taking stimulants to try and boost yourself further and further every single day. Eventually, that will just lead to burnout. So we aren't stimulating a flow state so much as enhancing an adaptable state from which flow should come much more easily. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. I haven't done one on nootropics or flow states for a while. Um, don't worry if you're looking forward to that Nightwing training part two. That is on the way. It'll be here in the next couple of weeks. Meanwhile, I've got some other learning from Legends videos and some cool tips on training, lots more stuff. If that all sounds cool, then thanks a ton for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.